I do a lot of coaching with other business owners. Um, and I, I tell them, you either are going to have a blessing or a curse with the type of the people you attract in your business. And the unfortunate truth and the good truth is they're going to be just like you. The question is, who are you? Welcome to GMP, the great, glorious, and glamorous, a.k.a. the Going North Podcast, where authors from around the world help you realize that success is tangible. You'll leave with at least one new piece of inspiration or information to help you keep going north. Now let's get on with the show. Today's episode is sponsored by the book that will empower you, encourage you, and through its expression, help you to advance to your next level. Stay the course. The Elite Performers, Seven Secret Keys to Sustainable Success by this guy right here you're hearing. And the good news is you can now hear the book on audiobook. So head over to Amazon.com or Audible.com or Apple Music, pick up the audiobook. And that's today's sponsor. Go out and buy a copy or a few of Stay the Course, The Elite Performer's Seven Secret Keys to Sustainable Success, and Advance North to Your Next Level of Greatness. And today on the High Live Real Builder for Authors, the Going North Podcast, aka GMP, the great, glorious, and glamorous, we got another super special, awesome human for you today, courtesy of another super special, awesome human. For those who may have been following the show for a bit, you may remember the lovely Eminem herself, Miss Mari Mitchell from the Dare to Be Authentic Podcast. Well, that lovely lady hooked me up with today's freaking guest because my goodness, my man is on a mission, baby, because he's a proud father, a husband a deacon, athlete, and entrepreneur who's passionate about serving his community and inspiring others to reach their goals. And you want to know the icing on the cake? He's a fellow freaking millennial. We're only four years apart. My man is doing some great freaking work, and I can't wait for him to dive into his story because he's got some great stuff he's doing, and my man is going to have freaking nine-pack abs of entrepreneurial goodness. So let's give it up for the HT himself, Hike Tadavosian. How you doing today, Hike? No, thank you. Wow, I love that introduction. I got fired up. I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, great this morning. Early morning, good morning, and uh, excited about a good day. I was telling you earlier before we start recording that we've got a team potluck going on today. So we're going to have a short day, giving my team a four and a half day weekend. They earn it. They've had a good year, another record setting year, and I can be more thankful of them and our customers. So today is, uh, you know, off to a, an amazing, amazing Wednesday here in the Seattle, Washington area. Amen to that. Amen to that. That's the record setting year. My goodness. My man freaking breaking records, baby. So my goodness, man. Like what, what do you think helped kept the team inspired this year? Like, do you think it's like all the surrounding nonsense to like, man, forget this nonsense outside. Let's perform at our best here. Like, what do you think helped contribute to that, man? I, I don't know. Inspiration to the team. That's a hard one. I mean, we've been here for 11 years. I started business in 2010 and every year I'm just trying to figure out like what is going to keep the team going. I think it's less about inspiration. It's more about, you know, consistency. You know, we're very consistent in having good days, right? So yeah, team is very competitive. I think it's also finding the right people. I've never really had good luck down finding people that I had to continuously inspire, right? Yes, I do. I'm very positive. I'm usually the most positive person in the room. Um, you know, I enjoy my team. I love my team. You know, they, they enjoy me back. But at the same time, the ones that I had to almost like forcefully inspire didn't work out. So I think it's an internal thing. I found people that are internally inspired and all I have to do is just add to what they already have. They do want to break records. Every year has been a better year than the year before. Uh, they are proud to be the you know, top producing office in our territory and they just don't want to lose the spot. Uh, actually, right now we have this new killer stud insurance producer in, in our territory. He's like keeping up with us and we're trying to fight with him this year. So they're like losing <laughs> sleep. We're, like, we're not going to be number two. It's not going to happen. So very competitive team for sure, for sure. But I think it's people. It's, it's finding the right people and uh, just keeping them inspired. Yeah, well, amen to that. You're so darn right. Like, and it's actually kind of interesting. You mentioned how your best folks are those you attract are the ones who actually don't need the 
real inspiration or it's like, yeah, you inspire people by default. That's what you do, especially as the owner of your company and everything. But it's like if folks continuously need it, it's like they don't work out as well. You're able to really draw the people to you that will do their best work. So my goodness, man. So, you know, as with all introductions, they're not allowed to be, uh, I say 77 days long. So mind filling in any cavities i missed about you because i'm sure there's a whole bunch of stuff i missed that got you to where you currently are today and where you're going i'll try to keep it as short as possible though so <laughs> uh moved to united states 20 years ago uh to pursue the american dream it was just my father and i uh we left my younger brother older sister and my mom behind in armenia for what we thought would be a short separation turned into seven years of not seeing the rest of my family uh, as you can imagine, you know, to get, you know, earn money, to save money, to hire a lawyer, to get your visa, to get your green card, to get your family to the United States. Uh, those seven years have taught me lessons that nothing would. A uh, 13 year old kid came to the country with no language, no money, everything from being hungry to sleeping in the car to doing whatever possible to make extra hundred dollars because that's the money we have to send back to Armenia to feed three people. You know, that taught me a pit bull like grip on financial success. I uh, got into the insurance business in my early 20s, uh, killed it. I mean, I was working 14, 16 hour days, seven days a week. To me, failure wasn't an option because I've seen what it was on the other side. And I still lose sleep over thinking, what if I have to go back? What if I lose it all? Worked my tail off, you know, and then I realized it's not about money because when I started making money, I'd sacrificed so much more. I'd sacrificed my health, my relationship. So Financial tank wasn't the only tank that brought happiness. An American dream, what I learned early on, wasn't just about the money. It was about freedom. It was about relationships. And it was about um, actual financial success as well, which led me to a point in my life where I realized I had to kind of figure out what this American dream is. Took a step back, started training, working out, uh, got into marathons, you know, got into triathlons. And at one point, I remember I reflected back on myself and I thought to myself, dude, the most successful person I know. And I wasn't the wealthiest by far. I know, you know, I have peers who are making a million times more. I wasn't the healthiest. You know, I know people who are way more fitter than me, but, you know, I'm healthy enough to do races and marathons and here and there. I uh, don't have the most amount of friends. I have, you know, good friends I can count on these fingers and don't have a huge family, two boys and a wife that I have a great relationship with. Um, you know, that being said, I just sat down and one day and wrote about what I thought my American dream was. And as I wrote for three years, I came up with a thesis, which is four pillars, family, fitness, finances, and friendship. I broke it down to, you know, each quarter of, of how to and what. And I just used my life examples to uh, create this wannabe long diary that turned into a book. And now I think it's really helped me to inspire some people, to help shape some people's lives and really mentor and coach, which has been a place where I've always wanted to be is to unconditionally help people. Because when I was younger, I wanted to have a mentor, a good figure in my life, couldn't find one. And I told myself, if I can be worthy, if I can become somebody, I would like to be that guy. So here I am today on your show, Dom, bragging about some of these things. So appreciate you having me. Hey, man, well, it was great having you too, man. And besides, they ain't bragging if you're actually done it. That's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> At least the way I see it, as I say, it ain't cocky if you can back it up. Because my goodness, man, like that is definitely rough like coming from armenia at the young age but just you and your dad and not being able to see the rest of your family for seven whole years and then just fighting scraping and clawing just to send money back while actually still trying to have at least enough to keep the at least your you and your dad fed for the next week as you keep trying to make ends meet all the way to now where you yourself are an author and in a way a mensch, a good person trying to help other people. And my goodness, my goodness. And you mentioned something powerful, those four Fs. So if I'm not mistaken, what was it? Family, finances, what were the other two? Family, finances, fitness, and friendship. Uh, there we go. There we go. So what led to the four Fs? Because I'm pretty sure faith has got to be in there somewhere since you're also a deacon. Well, uh, faith is not a separate pillar. Actually, my brother was also a deacon told me, he goes, what about the fifth F? I'm like, there's no separate F. Faith is what starts it all, what keeps it all together. It's the glue between the other four, right? Uh, so I didn't separate the faith. Faith is literally what keeps it together. And um, I, came up, I, I came up with the theory completely by accident. Um, and I just used my story. And I think I was completely incorrect with my thesis. My thesis was, first, you figure out your finances, because there was a monkey on my back telling me, dude, you're broke. You're hungry. Get your money right, right? So I did everything possible. Read every self help book. I've done everything. I've I've followed and copied people. I want to sound like them, talk like them, be like them. So I reached out to all the top people in the industry. 
So figure out the finances. Then I used the money to buy time back and I used the time to get my fitness back because I was 250 pounds. So I started taking gym breaks, going to, you know, uh, to LA Fitness down here. It's the name of the gym that we have locally here. Running outside, brought my, you know, fitness back into my life, got very fit, started looking better, feeling better which brought mood, intentionality, and relationships, which were my friends back, and time, and going out, and having a good time, which brought my relationship, my wife, and my two children, right? So as I wrote, them, I was talking about there's a specific order to the pillars. You figure out money first, health second, your relationships third, and fourth, when you create a family and you manage. As I wrote, I almost wanted to throw the book out the window. <laughs> so yeah. two years after I wrote that, <laughs> I heard pieces about this order that I came up with, right? I talked to a couple of my friends, one of them, um, actually a few of them, when I said, you know, the doctors, right? They, the PhDs, and they all had dissertations. Essentially, they wrote their own books. And I, I asked them, and then same question to all of them, and uh, well, all of them, three of them. Did you have a thesis when you did your dissertation? The answer was yes. I'm like, when you wrote your thesis initially, did you end up disagreeing with it by any chance later, middle? He goes, oh, absolutely. I'm like, so what did you do? I had to go back and re revise the whole thing. They said mm -hmm. there's something very special about knowing you have to put something on paper that you have to defend in front of a group of intelligent people. So when you're writing a book, you want it to make sense. That's why I edited it for two years. I could not put it out there thinking that people might read the book and think I'm an idiot. So uh, I went back, changed the entire book. Again, a few years of editing. Uh, my thesis changed from an order to no, there's no order. Everybody has their order in a different ways, depending where they're on their life. And to simply put, we work on the biggest monkey on our back first, address the second, third, and fourth, and have this imperfect balance just going up and down, up and down. So it's almost releases control of thinking, here's what I got to do next. No, you work on the biggest monkey on your back and you rebalance imperfectly moving forward. To me, my order was financial first. So I started with finances. To some people, it might be, dude, you got to shave your fat. You need to quit eating all the bad food, drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes. So you take care of that monkey first and then you go to the next one and then you go to the next one. And I've learned to be okay with the fact that I'll never have it perfectly balanced. Never. I've been cutting sleep lately. I think I'm kind of taking a step back on my health because I'm studying for this tough exam, financial exam I have to take, right? So that's taking a pillar back and I haven't had much family time with my boys and I actually just passed one of the series of the tests yesterday. So I'm gonna take a few days off, spend some time with my boys. I have a half marathon on Saturday. So again, it's, it's back and forth, back and forth. And especially how busy uh, with how life is in America, right? The American dream doesn't also talk about how hard you have to work and how long your days are and how disciplined you have to stay and how modest you have to be. And you have to not let the success get to your head. So there's a lot of lessons I just dumped into the book. And I felt like I read every success industry book out there as I could find, put my hands on. I just wanted to make sure I write mine with my own language and my own thoughts and my own philosophies. And that's how the book was born. And that's how four pillars were born. Uh, well, amen to that, man. Four great pillars indeed. Cause I'm um, so darn right. Like it's like this, this whole thing about work life balance. It's like, as you're going through life, everything's never going to be perfectly balanced. Like especially with the finances and the fitness like those can actually be working tandem together because at the same time it's like if you get a bunch of money but you can't even freaking move your body because you're freaking obese and what good is the freaking money besides paying your freaking health bills it's like if you can do both in tandem if not all four of them in tandem like keeping those at the forefront like hey like that's freaking amazing yeah it's useless yeah there's a what is that saying um dream is free but the hustle is going to cost you question is what is it going to cost you yeah yep that's the thing too it's like yep definitely got to hustle definitely got to hustle indeed and definitely keep yourself energized as well because my man's been doing that along with everything that he's been doing so my goodness man so with those four f's talking with your buddies with their dissertations and them giving you the confidence to edit your work for two years my goodness is there any other particular big lessons you've gained from finally getting this book into print and putting it out into the world? Um, there's a good quote. I repeat myself. No one cares work harder. I mean, it's writing a book <laughs> did more for me than actually having the book. Yes. The book has helped me hire some ridiculous talent in my business. It helped me inspire my team, the community. I've done a lot of work. I've been getting feedback. People calling me, asking me questions, but what I had to become in the process to finish a book, if somebody told me that was going to take up three years of my life where I had to, you know, I've got two boys, five and seven, as I was writing them, they're little, you know, they're like one and three. 
um, you know, between rocking them to sleep and typing with one hand, you know, <laughs> going in the gym and I'm spending time on the Stairmaster for two hours and typing up on my phone to paste it into the Word document between meetings and coaching sessions and conference calls. It was one of those things where it's almost it was it was a, a very humility like humbling reminder that I don't care how ambitious you think you are. If you get yourself into something new, it's going to bring you back down and beat you up and you've got to get stronger. So it was a reminder that I had to get stronger. No one cares. Nobody's going to help you. Nobody's going to. Hey, let me write that for you. Let me finish this for you. Let me publish it for you. Let me, you know, all these different things. Um, it's it just a humbling reminder that I don't care how cool you think you are, how capable and smart and hardworking. When you get into something that's difficult and that's new to you, man, it's going to remind you how tough things can be. And I think it's very important that we as human beings always get into something that we're not good at. Like when I had to transition from weightlifting to running, like I ran two miles, my ankle swelled. Mm -hmm. Right. So I had to teach myself how to run 26 miles. That was a journey. And then now, you know, my team was like, hey, hi, guess what? I'm like, what? They're like, we bought you triathlon tickets in six months. I'm like, I don't know how to swim. Right. They're like, oh, you, I, I think you can learn. You're so ambitious. I'm like that, you know, guys, I don't have time. So guess what? I had to be in the pool five in the morning so I can make it to the cycling class at 545. <laughs> right? So, so two laps, three laps, four laps, worked my way up to hundred laps in the pool, but it was very humbling to drink water, to suffocate, have water coming out of my nose. It taught me that, you know, you're really not that cool hike. You're not that good at what you do. So the book was another reminder that, um, you know, don't let some of these things that you're good at to get to yourself. And I think it's, it, yes, it's good to do things that you're good at. It reminds you that you're a winner, but also you have to do stuff that you're not good at to remind you humility. So it was a combination of both what these four pillars have taught me, um, as well as it kind of brought me back to earth. And also um, uh, the book taught me how to write better. Right? So I learned to type emails better. And my team comes to me, can you help me word this email to a customer or to this professional? And uh, definitely inspiration and leading uh, helps to know that you have a book. So that, that was uh, a big stepping stone, not just for me as a uh, leader in my organization, but also as a leader in my community and my family. Ah, that's what I'm talking about, indeed. So, well, I got to so say, your team bought you some triathlon tickets out of nowhere. So, was this a? So, are they part of your accountability buddy system too? <laughs> Keep you on your toes as well. Is that how this happens? Oh yeah, yeah. I have I have a really good mentor in my life. His name is Ali. Uh, he used to be a stockbroker, like a legitimate, like crazy cold calling. You know, you've seen Wolf of Wall Street. Like that was him. Um, he said <laughs> one time uh, back in the day when he was a stockbroker. I think it was his 90s, right? He said. Uh, we would take companies public, IPO, would do initial public offering. And a lot of times we wouldn't know too much about the companies that were selling their stocks for. But one thing we knew, if the company had a CEO that ran marathons, their stocks did well. And this was 11 years ago, 12 years ago, I had this talk with them before I opened up my own business. Because uh, we do insurance and financial services, so we talk a lot about money and investing. Uh, one of the things he said, he said, I don't know, but maybe you'll figure it out. <laughs> So, which is what inspired me to get into actually one of the reasons why I, I did the marathon to figure out what it is. So I remember I ran my first marathon. I was, I was, you know, not prepared. My legs failed mile 20 horrible experience, by the way, I, I never wanted to do it again. Somehow I finished, you know, I called him a few days later and he's like, what's the lesson? I'm like, I have no idea, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm like, I'm, there's no lesson. I sacrificed so much. And then, um, lesson came a few years later and I learned that the lesson was influence and inspiration what it do to my team, the people that did admire and look up to me, people that saw me track my steps, have a watch that measures my mileage and, you know, trying to decrease my heart rate. They were inspired to do the same. They were doing 5Ks. They joined me for Spartan races and mud races, local stuff. They uh, liked seeing my posts on social media about fitness. So I realized they got into fitness, right? So it almost my fitness tank inspired their fitness tank. And when their fitness tank got better, their friendship tank got better, their finances tank got better, they got more successful. So uh, lesson to me was, you know, when I keep myself accountable and I do something difficult, it inspires my team to do it. And when they do it, they continuously want me to do it. So it's almost like we're going back and forth and pushing each other to do better. So I think hard things as a leader in life are almost mandatory because it's part of the influence you create in your organization. I do a lot of coaching with other business owners um, and I, I tell them, you either are going to have a blessing or a curse with the type of the people you attract in your business. And the unfortunate truth and the good truth is they're going to be just like you. The question is, who are you? Mm -hmm. You look in the mirror 
and you're consistently on time or consistently early, you're working harder than the most, you're more positive than the most, you're more inspired than the most, your team is going to be probably like that. But if you're negative, you're all about the news and all about COVID and these problems that are happening and, you know, drama queen, well, that's going to be your team. So ask yourself the question, is your team really who they are or is it who you are? Uh, so that accountability piece is huge, Dom. A lot of it goes back to what you see in the mirror. Man, oh, man. Man, man, man. My man dropping the heat, baby. That's right, my man dropping the heat. Yes, it did. Keeping y'all warm when it's chilly outside, man. My man dropping this heat, baby. I'm telling you, It man. is cold in Seattle, though. <laughs> <laughs> I actually wore my winter jacket today for the first time. And I'm thinking to myself, am I overdoing it? I, I went outside. I'm like, I am so glad I wore my winter jacket today. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Good, good deal. Good deal, indeed. Because, uh, East Coast, especially states like Maryland, my goodness, it's like, well, I jokingly say you got to wear Speedos and a fur coat because the weather changes so much. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, no, a question like that is, uh, let's say 9% of the guests now, since uh, you're on the guest side of the game and doing quite a few of these, is there a question that you wish you'd be asked more often? Ooh. No, <laughs> uh, you know, I'll tell you why I said no, dumb. So I recently opened up another branch um, about six miles away from here in a city called Kirkland. And, um, and I've got a new team in there. So I've got the season team here in the main office and I got a brand new team. And it's almost like here I have these 25, 30 year old seasoned kids who are self-sufficient. They've got income. They got their own houses, their own cars. They don't call me unless there's like a big problem. But when they do call, I'm like, ooh, kind of like bracing myself. Then I got the newborn team. It's like triplets, you know, I'm changing their diapers and wiping their butts, right? So uh, there's a lot of questions <laughs> on me, now, so like 10, 20, 30 times a day sometimes. So as, as far as your question, Dom, I don't know if there's a specific question. Lately, I've been asked uh, the question is, why do you, you know, I'm very busy, by the way, I'm very busy, right? So people ask me, why do you do endurance races? You know, and, and, and to, to make things clear on why endurance races, um, like my last uh, Ironman 70.3, it's a half Ironman, which is a, like about a five hour race. You have to train for about 10 to 15 hours a week, six weeks prior to the race. And before that, you're probably averaging seven, eight hours, you know, six mm -hmm. hours just to maintain. So um, why would I put myself through that pain is a question asked a lot. Like, what's wrong with you? Um, but it's also, it, it gets, that question comes to me from a lot of people who don't do much, but then some of the go-getters are like, oh, I'm, I love seeing what you're doing, right? Well, I do it because it keeps me sharp. I do it because if I don't do difficult things that I control, the uncontrollable crap that life throws my way becomes annoyingly difficult. Mm. Annoyingly difficult. It's like, why am I complaining about a guy cutting me off? Why am I complaining about the fact that my wife asked me to do this? Why am I complaining about the fact that I'm losing my temper if my children did that? Why am I negative about having more emails than I expected? Because guess what? That's called control. And the more control we try to have over life, the more pissed off we'll be because it's like the lowest standard we can set ourselves, right? Uh, so I'm okay to be disappointed all the time because nothing is controlled, nothing, right? So I try to control what I can and what I can influence, which is the training difficulty, pain at you know, the five o'clock in the morning, sweat session for two hours in a garage, because then I come to work or I go talk to my wife or I go talk to my kids or I go in front of my friends and they say something that most people react poorly. And I'm like, I'm, I'm resting right now. What's up? <laughs> I'm just blessed that I'm sitting down. Thank you, God, for the chair, you know? So, and, and that's, you know, one thing I learned from my brother too, you know, your work and your family and all those different things are going to be difficult, but it shouldn't be the most difficult thing you do. Like choose something hard and do it over and over and over. Right. So that's why I do it. Time-wise, like when do I find the time to train that much? common question I get asked not that I wanted to be asked more but very common is it's less about time it's more about priority you know top 20 percent like if you make a list of 10 things that take up your life the top two will take up 80 percent of your time like the top 20 percent of stuff takes up 80 percent of your life uh, so my, my my response is always choose your 20 wisely mm -hmm. guess what that training is in my top 20 family and work my top 20 and those three things take up 80% of my time right now. Man, I don't watch the news or I don't have cable television at home. You know, I, I, I don't have time for that kind of stuff. I came to this country for a dream and dream does not include four hours of television per day. <laughs> <laughs> 
dream does not include four hours of television per day. My goodness. <laughs> now, that should be a social media quote right there. <laughs> you know what? No. Good, good, good masterminding sessions create those kind of sessions, uh, those kind of sayings during the sessions, right, Dom? Oh, yeah, you could definitely say that again, man. And like, dude, like, especially with your top 20% really dictating your life, because I've heard of the 80 20 rule, and I'm sure a lot of folks have heard it to listen to the show, heard about the 80 20 rule, but it's never heard it said that particular way. And it makes so much sense because it's so true. Like, whatever is in your top 20%, like, make sure it's something that you truly care about. Like, with you, it's your work and your family as well as the fitness with your goals. So, I love it. I love it indeed. So uh, next question for <laughs> the newer guests after freaking November 20, freaking 21. So since your book is mind food, I like to call books mind food, the power of mindset. If it was a particular food item or meal, what would it be and why? Uh, it would be chocolate. It would be chocolate because it's got caffeine and sugar, everything that I need personally. Um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> on, on a serious note, um, I, I'm a strong believer that it's, it's all in the mindset. Um, it's not about genetics or luck. You know, you create your own luck. Yeah, some people get lucky and they win the lottery. Some people get lucky and they get a promotion that they don't deserve, right? It happens. But majority of people don't get lucky, right? Because I've had a, I, one of my friends was like, oh, success is all about luck. It's being in the right place at the right time. I'm like, but you got to put yourself in the right place in the right time. Like, am I lucky that on Saturday I've been working my butt off and my goal is to run a sub 130 marathon, which means I have to average like a 650 per mile. Like, you can call it a lot, but the amount of sweating and pain I had to go through it, I'm a 205 pound endurance athlete, Dom. I don't know, you know, like if people understand how much pain that might be a my way to try to run fast, right? There, it's not luck. You know, I'm not lucky to be built big, dumb, heavy, you know, like that's, but I'm working with it, right? I'm sacrificing. The hustle is going to cost you, like I said, right? Every dream is free, hustle will cost. It's a very, interesting question you asked now caught me off guard like what food would it be and i think the reason why i said chocolate is because i've got this connection to sweets because my mom raised me on a lot of sweets and i was separated from my mom for seven years and sweets brought back that home feeling that content feeling i needed to almost feel like my mom was around and i'm a, I'm a mommy's boy like she's five feet tall i'm six two she comes over I, I still put my head on her shoulder and she pets me like that's my relationship with my mom like nobody can like i i'll do anything for my mom you know so in, in a way, to me, it's almost like if I'm eating chocolate, it reminds me of my mother, right? So if that's a feeling I can portray to somebody else and be like, look, if you want to feel home, if you want to feel balanced, if you want to feel like your mindset's in the right place, you know, my chocolate essentially is that food that my book was the reason why I wrote. So I want people to feel like they're read it and there's no answer to like, what is the purpose of life? But it's got a lot of aha moments that's going to make you feel like, dang, like this is what I needed to read. I needed to hear this and uh, it's okay not to be perfect. It's okay not to have, you know, balance. It's okay not to be fit. It's okay not to have all the money in the world. Right. Uh, but also strategic steps to make you feel home, to make you feel good, to make you feel like there's clarity before you take action because you can't just take action if you have no clarity. Right. So I um, mm -hmm. talk about my four principles, which is uh, clarity, action, activity, results. If you're clear about your goal, uh, it like hundred percent clear. You have to know exactly what it is, right? It's like, I got to lose 20 pounds. That's very clear versus i got to lose some weight or, you know, <laughs> at least action action. Isn't like, okay, I know I have to exercise. Uh, well, what kind of exercise, which is the activity itself. Activity leads to specifics showing up at five in the morning or six in the morning or 10 o'clock. Doesn't matter. I'm going to do one mile warm up. I'm going to do bench press. I'm going to do some squats. I'm going to, you know, yep. And then if you do repeated uh, process enough times so of activity results follow, right? So Long answer to your short question, chocolate, Dom. <laughs> chocolate. Hey, man, it's all good, man. Ladies love chocolate. And plus the wonderful thing that you mentioned, being a mommy's boy and still having the supreme love for your mom because it's like, hey, you only get one mom in this lifetime, eh? So it's like, hey, always cherish your mom and your parents too. So that's right, folks. So if you're buying this book right here, it'll be like getting reminders from your mom to where you go before you leave the house. <laughs> i love it i love it thanks Dom. <laughs> yes indeed so definitely want to be respectful of your time so we're coming down to the magical question that every guest gets to receive and that is if you're to wake up tomorrow and you're 25 again but this time you're in a current year with all of your knowledge and experience what advice would you give to yourself ah i was very blessed and lucky to be exposed to good leadership when i was younger very good mentors in my life so they saved me 10 years of my life. And what I learned 
it's not necessarily about becoming successful. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes of life is not failure. It's about not succeeding at the wrong things. Because imagine mm -hmm. succeeding at the wrong things. That will set you back 10, 20 years. Like that is not the career I needed. That is not the marriage that I was supposed to commit to. That was not the health goal I should have. I shouldn't have been a rock climber. I should have been this. You know, like at 25, which is nine years ago for me, I'm 34 now, so almost 10 years ago. You know, I think I was doing a lot of things right, Dom. Like I was grinding, I was creating a family. But my message to a lot of other 25 years that I do see out there is life is not just about fun. Like I, I understand that, you know, you're like, I want to experience my young years, but what's going to happen when you're 50? So think about the future a little bit more. Think about what's going to happen when you're 50 years old, because everything you do in your 20s is a residual that's going to compound over the next 10, 15, 20 years. And unfortunately, you're going to pay for it tenfold, right? So, you know, discipline yourself. Cut sleep once in a while. I did do that a lot. And I'm in my mid-30s. Everything I'm grateful for. Everything. Like literally every single thing I'm thankful for today. My relationships, my health. I've got some great friends. I've got some great peers. I'm best friends with my wife. I love my children. You know, I have a great relationship with my parents. Like I said, I'm not a super athlete, but I'm very athletic. I'm very healthy. Uh, actually, it's funny. I'm, this is the oldest I've ever been. I recently bought more life insurance because I have more need, you know, more kids and, you know, more liabilities. Uh, this is the healthiest results I've gotten in the 10 plus years I've been buying life insurance for myself. Um, so health has been getting better, right? It doesn't have to get worse. But it was decisions I made 10 years ago that are compounding today. Um, you know, money's great. Money's great. Like I'm able to afford the house that I want. I'm able to drive the cars that I want. I'm able to pay my team more. You know, I want them to feel like they're overpaid. You know, even though if you ask them, they probably feel like they're underpaid. But I, I think they're very well. <laughs> they're one of the best paid team members in the entire industry. So 20s, you're really shaping up your 30s. 30s, you're really shaping up your retirement, in my opinion. So think about the future. It's not just about the fun on Friday, Saturday night. If you're living your life to clock off work and to just go party on weekends, it's going to be a rough 40s and 50s for you. Ah, amen to that. Amen to that indeed. Definitely. Definitely got to take care of the future indeed. And you're right about that compound because it's, it's so darn true. Like just looking back 10 years ago just on my life personally like the stuff i was doing the spiritual development and heck even wow that was like the airport got into the car wrecks and everything it's like it's actually still paying off today so you're so right about that it does compound over time especially if you do all the right things just imagine doing all the right things and they compound 10 years to the future like imagine yeah. how well off you'll be man so that's powerful dude and none of them are instant right i mean it's like you know, bad things too. Like you said, car accident, right? Does it seem like a big one? Um, were you were you hurt pretty bad? Uh, more internally than physically. Thank God I didn't break any limbs or anything. <laughs> yeah, it, it was on my 21st birthday. I'm away to IT security class. Went to make a left turn. The car freaking skidded to the corner, brake jammed, and car freaking crashed. Wheel came flying off. <laughs> Couldn't drive the car for a month. So, yeah. Oh. Man, well... There was an angel sitting on your shoulder that knew exactly what to do when you needed the help, right? Um, yeah, man. You know, a little thing like a small back injury 10 years ago could be what paralyzes you today, right? Mm -hmm. You know, those are the little things that compound over time. A little decision to read a book 10 years ago, right? So nothing's ever instant, but they all have long-term effects. Learning to hold the door open for somebody, just smiling first thing in the morning or waking up an hour before everybody else does to do something for yourself, right? Be a little selfish with your time. None of them are instant, but they all have long-term consequences. And, you know, you choose if they're good or bad. That's right, indeed. That's right, indeed. Well, folks are going to choose to buy copies of your magical book because it's good stuff. Cause my man's been dropping heat indeed. So for those who want to not only buy copies of your magical book, but keep up with the wonderful things that you're doing in this world, what's the best way for folks to do so? People can follow me on social media. You know, I'm not too active. I'm actually get, getting very active. I'm starting to post more stuff on there. So I've got a uh, Instagram account, hike, H-A-Y-K, under, underline agency. So hike agency or Hike Tadevosan, but also you can find my book on Amazon, uh, Just the Power of Mindset. Uh, if you just type in my name, Hike Tadevosan, I'm the only one who published the book on Amazon with that name. 
I have a website that directs the book purchases to Amazon. So it's just my website. It's got some information, some blogs. It's hyket.org, H-A-Y-K-T.org. You can find my book on there and see some of the um, blog posts I've made as well as connect with me as well. If you can send me an email, shoot contact with me. I'm not too fast to respond with a lot of emails I get these days, but I usually don't miss anybody. So thanks for that shout out, Don. Appreciate it. And uh, very thankful to be on your show. Yeah, well, I'm thankful for you too, man, because my man is making a positive difference on the planet Earth. And that's what we need more of now today, folks. So you definitely head over to Hike's site. Indeed, it'll be in the show notes about some copies of this magical book. You know why mine sits a big buzzword nowadays? Because really, it controls just about everything else. So definitely pick up copies of this magical book, gift it to your friends, family, cat, penguin, dog, heck, maybe even a frog. So that way the frog will have a higher hop mindset. You never know. You never know. <laughs> oh, there you go. Hop higher with hike. There we go. <laughs> oh, I love that. I hope mine said I'm stealing that. I added that to my wallet of jokes. <laughs> oh, there you go. It's a very small wallet, though. It's not. It's not. It's five jokes in it. Now it's six. <laughs> there you go. There's no weed involved. It's just hopping. <laughs> love it. Love it. I That's like that. Good. Oh, man. So any parting words before we close up shop, my man? Uh, I'll share my favorite saying. To live in regret is to live in the past. To live in fear is to live in the future. To live happily is to live in the moment. I'm not saying don't plan. I'm not saying don't have goals. You should have ambitious, hardcore goals in your life. But be mindful of 90% of what you fear never happens, which takes away the moment of joy today. And today is what creates all the opportunities for tomorrow. And living in the past, you don't change anything about it. So enjoy the moment. Make the most of your day impact your relationships, smile, make people smile, make their day, make their life, and just, you know, pray, hope, and everything's going to be okay. How's it going, my friend? I'm so glad you made it to the end. That shows that you are an uncommon finisher, and I am so grateful for you sharing your ears, your attention, and your time to this wonderful podcast to do something that'll take yourself to the next level and for everybody else involved in this wonderful program share with with at least three people in your network so that way more folks can not only catch the fire that is on this podcast but can also be inspired to be their best 